It's time to talk about the latest comic book retrospective. This week, we're going to talk about Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, number one. We're on essentially the 50th anniversary of this character debuting. It seems like Marvel's not doing much. This came out in June 1972. The first story is called Out of Hell, a Hero, Archie Goodwin, George Tuska, with special contributions by Roy Thomas and John Romita. And here to talk to me about that is award-winning comic book editor, writer, Joe Corral. How you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Talking about some Luke Cage. We've also got the voice of the voiceless, the man so cool they call him the breed. Eric Breed, how you doing? Doing well. All right, so this comes out even before you start reading comic books there, Breed, and you've been reading comic books for a long time. June of 1972, it's been a very long time. This is a very important comic book, Breed. It's essentially the very first comic book from either DC or Marvel starring an African-American superhero in Luke Cage. Yeah, I remember when, when I first, when I did start reading in late '75. One of the first couple books I found was a Marvel two and one where the thing teamed up with Power Man, and I found his book right away, and I loved it. It was, it was there was a something that this character had a feel to it, and the the books were a blast to read. And unfortunately, I yeah I couldn't get a hold of number one for years, so I'd read probably dozens of of power man issues before i ever got to see how it all started there's a lot of really interesting stuff here joe you're a comic book writer they accomplish a lot in this very first issue laying down the origin of the character motivations introducing a couple of main villains for uh, luke cage to deal with and a lot of the the themes that are going on here and what i really appreciate there's a lot of genre mixing here it's not just a superhero comic We've got some um, some black exploitation. Obviously, that was kind of one of the flavors of film that you were getting at the time. There's also yeah. a lot of prison stuff kind of happening within here. I think it's done really well, but I don't know with some of the dialogue that you could probably make this comic exactly how it is made like today. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's just some vernacular and stuff like that you you, you wouldn't use today because it it sounds dated or you, you know we just don't talk like that anymore. Beyond that, I mean structure of the story and i know i make this point a, a, a bunch and sometimes it's more flippant than others but when you read this comic at the end of it i'd be hard pressed to find people that wouldn't think for a second like was that one issue or did mm -hmm. i just read because it feel you feel like you're reading multiple issues of a comic gotta give that credit to you know archie goodwin george tusca uh billy grand the inker uh, and, and one thing I really want to point out here is Billy Graham is a black man who inked this issue. A lot of people will bring up how, um, you, you know, a lot of these characters were, you, you know, uh, created and, and uh, facilitated by, you know, straight white men. And while that's, you know, the majority of, of the case of comics uh, at the big two at the time, you know, Billy Graham was involved. Steve Englehart has said that Billy Graham also contributed a bit, you know, plot wise over the years to, you know, uh, Luke Cage. So I really think it's important to note that uh, many people listening to this, uh, if you you love Silver Age comics, Archie Goodwin and George Tuska, you'll probably think more of Iron Man, um, especially George. He he didn't have a lot of runs on comics. He worked on a ton of comics, but the closest thing to a run he probably had was Iron Man. And and Archie's probably known by people more for his editing work, but um, he's also been involved in co-creating characters like um, like Harvey Bullock over in, in Batman and stuff like that, and uh, collaborated with Walt Simonson on the Manhunter saga, which is another favorite of people. So. Yeah, so this thing is absolutely fantastic, and we don't even really see Luke Cage, maybe until the last two pages of the story, because it does set up an epic origin story about you know where he comes from. He is in prison in this story, and you know, he gets his powers and everything. Absolutely fantastic. It starts out, you see who he is today, and they let you know this is a very special character, and we're going to tell you how he got here, and we jump back in time to Seagate Prison, and that is where there's a man named Lucas, He's in the hole, done something to get into solitary, and there's this prison guard. His name is Quint. He is mistreating the man. He's kind of verbally berating him, kind of daring him to come back so he can kind of uh, get some licks on him uh, some more before he goes out into the yard, Joe. And it's, it doesn't seem like a very nice existence for this character, Lucas. 
No, this is uh, it's it's pretty brutal. You get some really brutal violence here in a way that like people talk about, you know, Marvel Comics being more mature than than DC. And, and absolutely, this is the kind of comic you read through it and you go like, this is less for eight year olds and probably more for like, you, you know, immediately directed towards like college kids and things like mm-hmm. that. He finally gets out into the yard. He's immediately approached by a couple of, uh, of gangsters that are also in prison. I believe that the leader's name is Shade. And they want him to join them because there's going to be a new warden. And they want the new warden to know when he arrives that they're not taking any of his crap. So they're going to do something. If I'm going to get hit by a billy club, it's going to be for something I did, not something that you planned. You can count me out. They try to force him into it. I think a knife is involved. He ends up knocking this guy's teeth out. And we see like the, he's not really the warden, but he's the guy that's, kind of holding down the warden's seat until he arrives, sees this, sees as an opportunity to take take advantage of Lucas once more. He tells Quint, he's like, bring him in again, and this time I want you to break him while you break him, uh, when you put him into solitary breed. And it's pretty violent. This prison guard takes physical liberties with Lucas, and he absolutely tries to break his will and spirit by beating him down while everyone kind of listens. Yeah, the person you're talking about is Rackham. Yes. And he figures very prominently in this series for about another year after this. And it's worth it to keep going on the series to find out what eventually happens to him. Spoiler, it doesn't end well. And he's got Quint doing his dirty work. And he's living literally high on the hog until the new warden shows up. So the new warden shows up unannounced. They don't know he's there. Even the other guards are telling Quint, you're going too far. Like, you can't do like this. Like, you you might kill him or something. The other warden finds out. He goes in, and he kind of gets a little bit of justice for Lucas here because he lets the Quint know that, hey, you're no longer employed here, and I'm going to leave you in this solitary cell for an extra 10 minutes for Lucas so he can do whatever he would like to do with you. Sounds like he got his uh, bell rung, and but then he immediately goes to his office and he finds this character, this corrupt guy. He's smoking. He's got a bottle of whiskey in his office. He's all happy that he gets to be the warden kind of in charge for a few extra days. And that warden busts him down and really uh, lets him know that it's a new day within Seagate Prison, Joe. And he, he's not too happy uh, about that. He might even come back later. <laughs> and, and, and show us his disapproval and, and to lucas's surprise like things have changed so much they send a doctor over have him get examined and and you know it's it's interesting watching you know lucas as a character have to go through this and then you know the way they do it it's it's believable that you know things are changing it kind of gets lucas to sort of tell his story again with which uh it feels so or organic in a way that yes is it a little forced sure but like it does it doesn't feel as bad as some other instances where stories stop and someone goes but tell me your origin story no it makes sense in the story because he's he wants to use him for this program but he needs no more of his story because he goes i'm looking at your rap sheet and it doesn't look good and he's like well i was framed he's like well tell me the story then let's hear it and he talks about how he started out as a young man in harlem with his best friend, I believe his name is Stryker, and they were kind of hoods. They were running around. Turns out Luke Cage, or Lucas at the time, is the master of fist fighting, whereas Stryker is the master of knife fighting, and they start getting a name, getting a reputation. Lucas sees that it's going to go somewhere very bad. He decides to step out of the game as Stryker keeps taking it to bigger and bigger levels breed, and he ends up getting the, um, I guess, the attention of the syndicate, we're kind of after him, and um, it turns out that there's this girl. I believe her name is Ravine, and they both like her, so there's a little bit of a, a love triangle going on at the same time. And, it, and then the syndicate decide that they need to attack uh, a striker because he's done some things. He Maybe he stole some stuff he wasn't supposed to. Or he was just getting a little too big for his britches. So, yeah, they they attack Willis. Re- Reva Connors is the, the girl's name, and they're both, both sweet on her. They kind of get closer while Willis is recuperating. And, of course, when they go to see him, he immediately assumes the worst. Willis blames Lucas for him being there. He thinks that they, that Lucas put him up to it because he was out by then. The way he reacts is he frames Lucas by playing the drugs in his apartment. And that's how Lucas got sent up. And Even so though he had saved his life, like Lucas yeah. is the one that she calls well, and he goes in there and saves him from the syndicate, even though he's getting hit with brass knuckles. 
saves his life, but he gets very jealous and he sees and he realizes that those two are kind of sweet on well, each yeah, other. Yeah, which is which explains why Lucas dissolved the part the partnership. Willis is batshit crazy. Lucas is, you know, in and can't do anything about Willis, who is, you know, getting more and more in over his head, or so it seems, and you know, Reva, you know, he, you know who he's in love with, there's nothing he can do to protect her. And we find out how, you know, how it ends for her when they you know, chase them down and it, you know, Stryker's Willis, using her as a human yeah, as a shield. shield and they're like, shield. Well, we're not going to shoot around her. Yeah. He's going to shoot her and, and she dies. And that's yeah. essentially how he says that, you know, he, he was afraid. Obviously he had done some things when his earlier life, but he didn't have the drugs. They weren't him. He was set up by what was supposed to be his best friend. And the doctor's talking to him and he's letting him know. And I kind of felt bad about this because it did feel like Lucas was being used. He's like, listen, you know, you've got a rap sheet. You've, you've tried to break out of prison. These things have all happened. It might be good on your parole hearing if you join in this program that I have. We're going to do some experimentation. You're the healthiest man in here. You're the best, um, basically, guinea pig that we could find to do this experimentation. Although there is the danger that he might die in the process through this experimentation. Initially, Joe, he's like, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't want oh, to yeah. do your experiment. But parole is on his mind because he wants to be free. All the stuff with Reva, it, it has an impact, but it's only about four pages of content. Mm -hmm that story and it's like i felt more reading this about reva and the loss that you know lucas had than in a lot of other stories that really build up over a longer period of time so you know i think that important but then also you go here and, and you see all this beautiful work that you know george and billy are doing it's when when lucas gets there for the experimentation stuff, it feels like a, a brief Frankenstein homage. Like when Lucas <laughs> walks in. It. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, yeah, he says the whole Frankenstein's monster thing and the way Lucas is dressed, it looks like he's kind of in the the baggy like jacket with the black shirt and, and the, the pants. He kind of looks like Frankenstein just for really that panel. And then just the way everything's set up. And then finding out, like, oh, well, I got to inject you with something that's going to make you sick. Uh, yeah, like, we got to give you cancer or something to see if this will heal you. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I said, when you're talking about what finally pushes him to let Bernstein do this. When Rackham says, yeah, I may not be in charge anymore, but as long as you're here, I'm going to make your life a living hell. And Lucas yeah. says, I screw this. I'm doing it. So yeah, I, I want to yeah. get paroled. Yeah. yeah, it's all set up so perfectly. Like it, it really feels like a master's class in how to do an origin story issue. It's like if anyone were to do any work at the big two, this should be in a short pile of comics you have to have read and understand before you're allowed to write anything. You're not going to, I completely agree with you. And it's really interesting. So he gets in this pool, it's got all these chemicals and they're basically doing these experiments to see if they can change him or make him start healing. Like at a molecular level, we want your body to start healing faster. He's in this thing. They turned like the, I guess the dial to one and the doctor walks away. But in the meantime, Rackham comes in here. He hates Lucas and he just dials up to a level that was not supposed to be used at all ever. And the doctor comes back and they're like, what's going on? And then you start getting the first hint screen that something's changed in it because he's uh, I think he slaps Rackham and might have almost killed it. Like he's he's starting to have some really powerful moments here. Yeah, he, he, he slaps. Uh, I think it's Rackham. Yes, well, you may have just slapped him, but I mean, but he's hurt bad. Look, he hit him and, with a hammer. Yeah. And he th and he thinks he's you know screwed. So he just like just punches the wall in anger, realizes he's cracked the concrete. His fist is fine. So he just keeps punching it, you know, punches literally through the wall and makes a break for it on the ledge, throws a rock at the at the cops. They and they think they mistake it for a gun, so they just unload on, you know, he goes over the cliff. And they think they've shot him. They think he's yeah. dead. They find his shirt, there's bullet holes in it. And obviously he's bulletproof now. They don't know that. He didn't even know it. Obviously, the world thinks he's dead. And he goes on the move, he's gonna go back to New York. He has to find a new identity. He decides to combine uh, some elements of when he was in prison instead of Lucas, he's now Luke, and he talks about being in a cage, so now he's Luke Cage. He gets to New York, he doesn't know what he's going to do, Joe, and then he's outside of this building. A man is stealing something and tries to make it outside, and he stops him, 
and essentially stops this robbery from happening. And the store owner is very impressed. It's like nobody would have stopped this guy. Thank you so much. You know, this was our daily earnings and gives him a cash bonus. And he gets the idea. I'm Luke Cage, hero for hire. He goes out and creates a, a costume, a uniform, and starts printing business cards and trying to be make a name for himself as someone to hire if you're in a little bit of trouble. No, it's it's great. It's 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 a uh, it's a real quick or like that whole bit of, of him going to the diner and uh, it, you know stopping the robbery, getting the reward, and figuring out what he's going to do. That's one page. Pretty much. Yeah. That is one <laughs> comics page, and no, it's not ten or twelve panels. It's six panels. It's pretty standard comic page to get all that across. And it's followed immediately by, you know, him visiting the, the grave of, of River Connors and getting the costume. And and one thing that you'll, you'll always see people point things out like, oh, the old costume, it's, it's cheesy or it's, you know, like it's dated, this and that. But they make it a point in like he's very well aware of that. This was not something that was like, oh, he thought it was, you know, oh, it's really cool and hip at the time. He straight up says Outfit's kind of hokey, but so what? It's part of the superhero game. If I want to be a hero, i got to wear a hokey outfit. That's yep. what's going on in New York. And then we get this nice little page at the end to really set up what's happening with Luke Cage here for hire after this breed. We see Willow Stryker. He has become a bigger and bigger criminal while Luke Cage has been in prison. He's diving back since he, you know, because he's so good with the knife. And he knows what's going on with Luke Cage. He doesn't know that's Lucas. And he wants him stopped because he's starting to interrupt his criminal enterprise. Because it works on multiple levels. His new enemy is his old rival, and he doesn't know it yet. He will obviously eventually learn that. A uh, very so. quick-paced comic book. Almost everything you could have wanted to do in an in opening series, introducing a new character, is done here, uh, Joe. So it was a fantastic read. Really appreciate the art. Good characterization, yeah. and uh, I really enjoyed this one. You can see why Luke Cage got over yeah absolutely and um it, you know one thing that uh marvel did this year at the very least was they did finally put out a luke cage hero for hire omnibus which collects this and the first like 30 something issues uh, uh involving the character so very nice what are we going to check out next time joe i know normally you're the one that's curating the comic books what are we going over to dc right yeah, um, I I think it's uh, time we go back to uh, you know Doom Patrol, and I know uh, you know uh, Breen has this because it was in the the Silver Age Volume One trade it was uh, issue ninety two, the first appearance of Doctor Time. Marvel Comics weren't the only ones to court some of the black exploitation that was kind of going on in cinema at the time. We end up getting a character called Black Lightning from DC Comics. We actually reviewed. The very first issue of this from Tony Isabella as well. This is a fantastic comic book. If you're interested in these characters, definitely check this one out. This was a lot of fun as well. Good stuff right here.